Hello, everyone. Hello, Drac. Getting broadcast, going live. Oh, is it working? Who is Dr. Alexander Clark? That is an interesting question. I ask it for myself many, many times. Hello, everyone. Um, right then. <laughs> Let's see if this works. Hello. Hello, everyone. Good Lord, we're at 66. Um, I might have a panic attack now. So, uh, I just saw a question first off, which said, who is Dr. Alexander Clark? I'm a nutty naval historian. Um, that's pretty much the best description of me. I'm currently writing a book. Well, I say just just finishing off a book, which is going to be published apparently in December because they put it up for pre-sales already on Amazon on tribal battle and daring class destroyers. And today we're talking about what was my PhD topic. Aren't you Drac or you English guys sound like? Actually, funny story, uh, Drac is actually connected to me, but we are not the same person. But we have found we are connected by the same university. So we have... We didn't even realise it before we started talking. We did an interview the other day and we found uh, we just went, oh, so we've been talking on this and actually we could have just... It's disturbing. Also, I drink a lot of iron brew. I do apologise for this. Um, my girlfriend and my family are all fairly concerned that I have an addiction. <laughs> Force A1. Dr. Alexander Clark doesn't exist. He's just three bottles of iron brew in a trench coat. Uh, make it six and you might be just about right. <laughs> so, today's topic is design, design, design. And it's about aircraft carriers. It's about the aircraft carriers of World War II and where the Royal Navy's aircraft carriers in particular came from. Electro Blizz, uh, what is your opinion on town class? I think I've already covered that in previous ones, but I would say I rather like them. Um, today we're doing aircraft carriers, and the reason we're doing aircraft carriers is because it, this was actually my PhD thesis. And it got me in several fights with a lot of academics, and it's why it's been put off for a few years, because it's slightly different. Um, but... I always start off when I'm looking at aircraft carriers with the same quote. And for those who are following me on Twitter, that's at AC underscore Naval History. I will be tweeting out the slides live. I already put them out on the hashtag slide notes. So if you've wanted them already early, they're already there. And you can download them and you can have them in front of you. Because I don't yet have a working we working webcam despite ordering a month ago for teaching purposes so i'm doing this all through my phone so i can't do this uh, on the screen so i show it up like this but i also have it on twitter and it's able to be found so i'm just going to tweet out the first set of notes now um they're already slide notes are already up but these will be the first ones that's basically it's live so please come take part. Once TweetDeck actually gets through to it. And slide set one are going up now. Now. The que what we're going to be looking at. Uh, we are going to be looking at Courageous and Glorious. And we're going to be looking at all those. Don't worry. They're all going to be looked at if the computer and everything holds up. So it's at AC underscore Naval History. <laughs> so Ian and Carr, Ian and Carr, how effective could Courageous and Glorious have been through the war and what procurement changes for carriers followed the early war sinkings? Not really a lot. I'm going to explain why. But first of all, I'm going to do this because this is something I want you all to think about while, we're ta while I'm talking. Please consider the following. An RAF station operating 60 to 80 single or small twinned engine aircraft. Add the fuel, stores, firefighting equipment and so on which go with it. A couple of batteries of heavy anti-aircraft guns with ammunition and control gear. 
a minor Battersea power station, a big radio transmitting and receiving station, the radar, communications and other incendiaries of an RAF fighter sector controller, Consider all the men, about 2,000, and accommodation wanted for these functions, then issued them with all three months' provisions. Now put the whole lot inside a metal box, 800 feet long by 90 feet wide, by about 90 feet high, make the box self-propelled, and operate aircraft from the top of the lid. There is your aircraft carrier. And that description is courtesy of Admiral of the Fleet, Sir Casper John. Now, Casper John's book was actually, he was writing it before he died. He died. His daughter, Rebecca, finished it off. If none of you have read a book about the Second World War naval aviation, you should go and read this book and this guy's experience. Because he was with it the whole way through. He did so many different things. And he ends up, for Sea Lord, he does all sorts of things. My favourite story about him, though, is that is one told me by... Um, Michael Clapp, who was the Commodore in the Falklands War of the Amphibious Task Group. And his story was that a aide walked in and found him completely stark naked, painting. And the aide went, but sir, you've got to be ready in 40 minutes. Why are you painting? I had an idea. I wanted to get it down. And I didn't want to get my uniform ruined. So, hence, completely naked. <clears throat> Hello, creative horse in Australia. So... Aircraft carriers and design design. To start off with, what is the Royal Navy building from? <laughs> Hello, Juno. The Royal Navy is building from these. Courageous, glorious and furious. These are the key for their fleet operations and development. The Royal Navy is very lucky in the interwar years. They have more aviation, more aircraft carriers than any other fleet. They can do combined operations. They can practice carrier against carrier warfare. They can do practice everything they can to do it. And Stephen Connery, Sir, Casper's point explained near identically by Jerry Kibb when he was CEO of the carrier HMS Queen Elizabeth. I'm going to give you a bit of a clue, Stephen. I have a strong suspicion that Jerry Kidd might well have read Casper John's book. I, I'm not 100% sure. I, can't, I haven't asked him personally, but the description sounded so damn similar, I'm fairly sure he probably read it. Hello, Mohammed Salam. Greetings to Indonesia. Uh, right then. <laughs> what? Golden Eagle, at Dr. X Clark, what are you drinking? I'm drinking Iron Brew. It's what all nutty historians have to drink. <laughs> so, these are what was crucial for the Royal Navy when it came to starting up. These are what the Royal Navy was thinking about when they were building their fleet and when they were practicing it. But they weren't what they wanted to go with. Remember, they were conversions and they never were really happy with them. And by the way, this is a picture. I'm going to be showing pictures courtesy of this and they are going out on Twitter. They're courtesy of armoured carriers. Who he, the author of which is birthday today. Um, he runs a Twitter feed and he does a, a website. He sent me a whole load of pictures for today to use. But they're all thanks to him. So please go say thank you to him and happy birthday. Um, I'm Scottish but I don't uh, in family history, but I don't drink alcohol, which is why I drink iron brew, because I can't drink scotch. I get told off. Now... The aircraft carriers the Royal Navy's developing are one side of the coin, and you have to always consider what's the other side. Now, the reason I get in trouble with my PhD, and the thing we're going to be discussing today, is I'm going to argue the case and put forward it to you and explain why I believe it. The Royal Navy actually doesn't do much new thinking when it comes to garage design in World War II. A lot of it's based in pre-war thinking, which was fairly good. Yes, some of it's modified, some technologies added in, but a lot of it's based in pre-war thinking. And there's a very succinct reason for this. In the 1920s and 30s, the Royal Navy goes through all these aircraft. This. and get the other sheet out this and this now <laughs> they are all lovely aircraft in their own way barring and um, i'm hoping i've covered it up 
I don't want to cause outrage like I did the other day. Oh, yes. Um, we'll all ignore the Blackburn Blackburn, um, okay? Just everyone look away from the Blackburn Blackburn. It's ugly. <laughs> Ian Greenman, I'm currently building a series of What If RM Battleships imagining the post-World War One treaties never happened. I've done incomparable working on a super hood. Never thought of also doing some carriers. The Royal Navy carriers would have been bigger. Remember, the Royal Navy with glorious and courageous and all these ships, what they're looking at, they're thinking of, they're seeing what they want to use them for. And we already did a talk um, of naval aviation called Unic a, a Unicorn and a Flock of Swordfish about naval aviation in these war years and how the Royal Navy is developing these two strands. They have the strike carrier and they have the battle carrier. The strike carrier is to hang back from the fleet or to attack fleets which hide in harbour. That's HMS Ark Royal. The battle carrier, the illustrious class, are to be with the fleet, as close to the battle fleet as possible, so they can provide the ongoing air support in any fight, the air defence, the constant strike going on in any fight. Basically, the you have the Americans and Japanese are both going for these certain types of big carriers with all this sort of emphasis on a big strike hit, on a massive hit. The Royal Navy into war are developing sort of this idea that what they would prefer to do is to keep doing this, keep hitting. Keep hitting, keep hitting, keep hitting. Because their theory is if they keep the enemy under constant attack, if they can, especially if they can do that at night to an enemy, doesn't matter whether their forces are, are smaller in the local area or larger, they can fight them. Don't get start a catfish. They messed up on the Blackburn Blackbird. They built it like a ship instead of a naval aircraft. Don't get me started on the Blackburn Blackbird. It's just, it's just not a good aircraft, okay? It's just ugly and then you have the blackburn dart and oh it just gets worse it gets worse right now so i'm going to tweet out these now the second side because i'm going to spend a while discussing them because i want you to consider the points they made and it actually is the reverse of how i came to this um but strangely enough it actually argues the case more because I'm the son of a naval architect, so I came to all this from ship design. That's what I started looking at first. But whenever I'm making the case and I'm talking about the ships and I'm talking about the development of naval aviation, it's always easier if I start off with aircraft design. Because people turn around to me and go, but of course they built the ships. They were building the ships in wartime. They must have been making them according to the latest knowledge. Well... Please, if you can go to Twitter and can get this, have a look at this slide. I'll start explaining it now. Right. So these are the aircraft developments. The Swordfish was specified in 1930. It entered service in 1935. Uh, the Chesapeake, which is for the United States Navy, becomes the vindicator, well, it's a visit, uh, Chester Peak is in RN service, vindicator in, in, in US in service, 1934, enter service in 1937. Let me use something else. The Hellcat, fighter, most famous, one of World War II's key aircraft. Specifies in 1941, enter service in 1942, 18 months from specification to production. Other than that, Every single aircraft, Helldiver, Barracuda, Avenger, Avengers 1940, but that is pre-war for the Americans still, Corsair, Albacore, Fulmore, Wildcat, Dauntless, Buffalo, Skewer, Devastator, all the aircraft are all specified pre-World War II. All the aircraft were specified, were started their process designing pre-World War II. They weren't new aircraft. They were upgraded. Their engines were, uh, things had changed and evolved, but they were upgraded. Now, Ian Greenlee, uh, sorry chaffers, crap. The Rock, Skewer, Fulmar, Albacore, all crap. They weren't. Okay, we'll just take that one. I'm sorry. The Skewer, the Royal Navy was told it wasn't allowed to procure a dive bomber through the Air Ministry system. Henderson wanted to order one, and that was the third Sea Lord, is a guy called Admiral Henderson. And so the only way he can order the Skewer dive bomber is by calling it a reconnaissance fighter. 
So he gets that specification written up and issued in 1934. If he hadn't, and it wasn't called a fighter, the Royal Navy wouldn't have in 1939 and 1940, till about 1942, had a dive bomber. And you think how useful the skewer actually was in operations as a dive, dive bomber. It was very useful. So, yes, it's not a great fighter. But it's the best they could get. The Albacore is the last aircraft which is ordered under the old system, which is a slow evolution of the previous one, because the Royal Navy doesn't have direct access to the aircraft engineers, because the Royal Navy's procurement of aircraft is the Rear Admiral aircraft carriers by 1930s, prior to the getting back control from the industry, sends a point up a message up to the to the third sea lord, who's the person in control of the Royal Navy, who's in charge of procurement. They would then send a missive over to the Air Ministry, who would send a missive down to the Fleet Air Arm, who would then get that back to the Air Ministry, who would then send that off to the engineer uh, to the engineering companies as the specifications. And then it would come back the whole way through that process. So that is why aircraft tend to be a slow evolution, because you don't have this conversation between the engineers going backwards and forwards. Now, so when you're accusing, I can understand when people are talking at a skewer and calling it a fighter, I would agree it is terrible. But as a dive bomber, it's one of the most accurate dive bombers developed prior to World War II. So it's actually pretty good. The point, though, with all of this, the point that I'm trying to make is that aircraft take a long time to develop. We're talking four to five years. So why does the marker go round that aircraft carriers, the Royal Navy suddenly gets into World War Two and changes its designs of aircraft carriers and goes, oh, we've been doing it all wrong. They don't. The light fleet carrier is not a new design. It's an evolution of Unicorn, which is not a new design. And the others were going to get for it. Now, so I have to look at what is the fleet of 1944 that I am looking at what it gets to. So we've looked at where it was starting. Where does it end? Well, the fleet of 1944 is a pretty good example. And in this one, you have a forward a civilian support light carrier, aka HMS Unicorn. You have a battle carrier, which has had some modifications, aka HMS Illustrious. And in the middle, you have HMS Renown, who, as we know from... The other day, looking at the destroyers in Norway, HMS Renown is one of the most undervalued warships in Royal Navy history. When she was pissed off, she scared off Sean Horse and guys and now solo. So, yes, she might have been a battle cruiser. Yes, in theory, she gets beaten by the battleships every time. But by God, when she's pissed off because you've sunk one of her escorts, you run away and hide. <laughs> now, HMS Unicorn is pretty much one of my most favourite ships. I love her because when Henderson wanted her built, when he, they, he was told he couldn't have an aircraft carrier. He had to have a support ship. And he goes, yes, this is, I'm building a support ship. It's got a flat deck. It's a support ship. It looks like a light carrier. It's a support ship. What are you going to name it? HMS Unicorn. He gets a light carrier through construction, through treaties, as a forward aviation support ship, and calls it HMS Unicorn. The man was calling everyone's bluff. What was their purpose? Well, the Royal Navy was always building to fight a war in the Pacific, because if it could fight a war in the Pacific, then it could fight a war in the Atlantic, because that would give it enough reach, enough global reach, enough global presence. And it had to be a fight globally. It had to be a global navy. So it couldn't afford to go with the similar policies as the Americans and the Japanese who could, con for, who could concentrate on fighting in the Pacific, which is very large distances. But for Japan, there's their industrial base on one side. And for the Yanks, there is their industrial base on the other side. Whereas the Royal Navy, if they're looking at fighting in Japan, their industrial base is back in the Atlantic. That's the problem. That is the big problem for the Royal Navy. The aircraft, uh, their industrial base is back in the Atlantic. They have a great base for fighting a war in the Atlantic, but they might have to fight a war in the Pacific. So even prior to war, they've been thinking about this. So I introduce you to 
1936 Design X. Now, again, for those wanting these slides at AC underscore Naval History, if you want to go ahead, there's hashtag slide notes. All the slides are already up there. If you want to follow live, the slides will be added in. So this is Genesis Evolved. The Royal Navy actually has a design of aircraft carriers, which forms the base of its aircraft carriers dating back to 1934, a year after Admiral Henderson becomes third sea lord. This is in his middle of his time, in a way. And this is what becomes genesis for all the big carriers afterwards. For all the carriers. Because basically Design X is his going right then. Under treaty, we are limited in tonnage. So we have to build both a strike carrier, Arc Royal, big, less armour, but can carry more aircraft. And illustrious class, slightly smaller, more armour, less aircraft because we're only allowed a certain amount of weight. But what happens when the treaties run out? Well, when the treaties run out, we will need to build the carriers which can do both the strike and the battle role. They will need the armor of the battle and the strike capability of the strike. And that is what they were planning. So therefore, when you see implacable, indefatigable, which we're getting to later, when you see the evolution of the illustrious class up to formidable and the later plans for the far bigger carriers which would come afterwards, these are all progressions of these plans. These are all progressions of them. There's a great conversation going on about Bolton Paul Defiance versus Blackburn Rocks here. So I'm just going to quickly wade into that. Um, Chaffers and Bray, uh, this is a match burn to Chaffers and Bray. Uh, the Bolton Paul Defiant was only effective for a short time until the Luftwaffe caught on to it and developed tactics to seal them. Uh, then they were just as ineffective as the Hurricane. Actually, the Hurricane wasn't that ineffective. The Hurricane was a very, very good fighter aircraft and it was actually a very good carrier based fighter aircraft when the Royal Navy needed it. And the Royal Navy had a tradition of using them. As for the Bolton Paul Defiant, well, I think it found its niche as a night fighter. Yes, Stefan Pangung, HMS Malta, is the supercarrier that eventually is developed. Now, this is the Royal Navy's trick to achieving that strike carrier versus a plus battle carrier combined. The double deck hangar. And the double deck hangar is a very interesting one because it continues in service. And actually, it's really quite a clever idea. If we were thinking about it today, maybe for, not for aircraft carriers but certainly for LHDs a double deck like this scenario which could be used as carrier as hangar space or as space for storing vehicles would certainly be a very good thing to consider now I'm going to make sure those are now up because I'm not sure if I have tweeted up the slide set free but I want to sort of quickly consider, discuss them sorry I'm still getting used to all the technology. I do admit that. I've only been doing this for a few, about, this is week four, maybe. And I'm still very much getting used to it. So please bear with me and be very kind. So pretty much the Royal Navy pre-war is already working on their plans for how they're going to do this and how they're going to design them. And if we start off with this, this is their other design from 1936, a super armoured carrier. It's a really cool design, but what is most interesting about it and is something which I think most people would find quite funny when they realise is that it's carrying an air defence armament which would not be different from that fitted in World War II. I, in 1936, the Royal Navy was already working out that they needed to have more AA weaponry. And what's also interesting is she has a very tall and heavily supported mast. Is there anyone noticing that? In 1936, the Royal Navy wasn't fitting radar yet to its ships, but it had heard about it and they were starting it. They weren't getting much information out of the Air Ministry, but they were starting to look into it. And aircraft carriers were going to be a big thing of that. Make sure I get those there so I don't get them mucked up. Now, 
These designs all largely owe themselves to the experience of the 1929 fleet exercises. That sounds really sad, doesn't it? It took from 1929 for the Royal Navy to get uh, to 1936 for the Royal Navy's designs to start sort of featuring and developing from them. But actually, that's quite quick because the Royal Navy has a major exercise in 1929. They are the first massive exercises where the Atlantic Fleet and the Mediterranean Fleet come together to go all out mega war. And when I'm saying all out mega war, I'm talking 65% of the entire Royal Navy's tonnage at the time turns up, splits into two sides and goes, time to party. <laughs> uh, for about three weeks, the Italians, the French, everyone else was kicked out of the Mediterranean while the Royal Navy went to war. It worked well. The Royal Navy comes up with a few things. First things first is that in 1930, a Rear Admiral aircraft carrier is appointed. The person who's appointed is the former captain of HMS Furious, a guy called Reginald Henderson, who is considered absolutely amazing after what he did in the exercise. And what he did in the exercise was he managed to, ma uh, managed to carry out a night attack where he killed not only two of the two opposing aircraft carriers, but also knocked out four battleships. What's more interesting is that he was in board the, air, the torpedo aircraft, which did it. He actually went up with them. In VF-11B, in 1929, wasn't the RAF still manning the aircraft? Yes, they were. Again, I will refer to the interwar unicorn and a flock of swordfish pod, uh, video I did earlier this week. Um, or was it last week? I think it was earlier this week, um, on Tuesday. And they were looking at various systems. Uh, basically, the, whilst the RAF was still providing the pilots, the Royal Navy were providing the Observer Corps, and the Observer Corps were critical for them moving on and for developing. Now, what is really interesting are some of the conclusions you start to get out in 1929. One of the first ones is protection of aircraft carriers. Now, protection of aircraft carriers is critical because that is what starts to pave the way for the tribal class, the Dido class, the C class conversions to anti-aircraft ships. All these things which are critical for World War II come out of <laughs> two paragraphs. Despite the high seeds of the two battle fleets in this exercise, the protection of aircraft carriers did not cause either commander in chief any particular anxiety. However, they realized very quickly the importance of these carriers and therefore they assigned protection to them. That's what they do. The Royal Navy has various issues which come through. The Royal Navy has various things which come through in this exercise. And these exercises are critical for them in developing that. These major fleet exercises are also something else different in that they offer the Royal Navy a chance to do mass warfare, fleet battles, like no other navies getting the chance to do. And so this is where their idea starts to come from. They very much start in these exercises. What you have is at first they're working out, do they put the bigger carriers forward of the fleet and the smaller carriers back as the strike fleet? What do they do with the smaller carriers? And eventually they start to realise they can have the smaller carriers with a heavy fighter armament closer to the fleet as part of the battle fleet. HMS Eagle, HMS Hermes, HMS Argus start to fulfil this role. They've got a heavy fighter number. Their critical is for air defence. Their fighters are supposed to start to evaluate them. Um, David Burnham, quickly. How could the tribals with their low elevation mounts be considered protection for the carriers? Uh, they, if for starters, it was again, that would be against other destroyers and other things coming at night. But also, low elevation is a, strictly speaking, not quite correct. Okay, high angle means it goes up to 80 degrees. Low elevation means it goes up to roughly 60 degrees. Again, tribals... <coughs> modified their systems and managed to get them up to 65 even higher um 
So there is low angle, but also if you're predicting your aircraft, enemy aircraft aren't going to be doing dive bomber strikes, they're going to be coming in level and do their hits that way, then actually the angle was considered enough. Although match burn, both of us are bust, I do agree with. But both of us come in as the war goes on. The Royal Navy had done a prediction of air defence that they were going to need heavier medium guns, as they were calling them for AA weaponry. 40 millimetres, that sort of thing. But they didn't really get them until they got the production up. Remember, a lot of these weapons are very nice to have, but you have to get the factories producing them enough quantities and the money that you can build them. So... The Royal Navy is taking all this. They're working out how to work with submarines, how to work with all these things, and they're coming up with their designs. They're working on them. And as such, let me just get slide set four out so you can all get a closer look at those uh, write-ups on the 1929 exa things. I just realised I got so wrapped up I've forgotten the bottom. <laughs> I don't know. And please do have a nice look at these because they are cool. Not sure if it's going to work. I managed to put a spelling error in there. It might. No, it has. But it's called itself Slide Set Free again, I think. No ideas. Okay. By the way, for anyone who doesn't know, me and TweetDeck have a long running long-running argument. Dave Burnham, um, I thought the 4.7 inch had a maximum elevation of about 40 degrees. Depends on the mount and the type. Um, 40 degrees is the theoretical maximum for the gen uh, general as fitted to aircraft uh, destroyers. Some destroyers manage to quick them out more by canting them out. And um, later on, the they had all sorts of modifications go through. And of course, later on after that, the tribals would have the four inches fitted on the, in their X mount. So they had all sorts of things were changed. But yeah, if you're talking about the general 4.7 inch, you've got 40. But some of them managed to cant them up more. Because what it all is, is a certain stay point and needs to be modified. I had a long run, long conversation once with an artificer. And they explained it all to me. And it's gone completely over my head. So... First things first, the armoured carrier. How armoured was it? Well, this is your illustrious class. They're the basic for your armoured carrier. This is your armour profile. So, can people please stop calling it an armoured carrier? It's an armoured hangar carrier. <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, you have a strip of armour. You can only do this when you make... The flight deck, your strength deck. Now, here's the interesting thing. Ark Royal has this flight deck made a strength deck. And Ark Royal's flight deck is also armoured. To an extent. It's far thinner, but it is armoured. But she's not called an armoured carrier. And her job wasn't to do what these ones did. She, her job is to be a strike carrier. To be the one that sticks back to cover a wider area. To... Take out an enemy which is hiding in the sea, uh, hiding in a harbour, that sort of thing. There's, that's what the strike carrier does. The armoured carrier is supposed to get closer to the, ba the battle fleet, to work out with the battleships. Um, for example, HMS uh, Formidable gets very close at Matapan. Very, very close. I think it's Formidable. Or is it Victorious? I sometimes get Victorious and Formidable mixed up. I do apologise. It's dyslexia I could blame on. But actually, it's just I get the two mixed up. Now, what they did was they worked out that they needed armour on the sides and they needed armour on the top. Interesting enough, the armour gets very light around the elevator areas. That's because to maintain the displacement of the ship and to maintain its profile in the water, because the elevators are already heavy themselves, they actually have to reduce the weight of the armour, so they don't make those parts too heavy and ruin the profile of the ship in the water. <laughs> Jeff Beeler, HMS Unicorn was almost declared a battleship because there was available tonnage in that category. Actually, that is one of those myths, but that's not true. 
there was not enough tonnage available in the battleship category for starters for her. Um, the Royal Navy didn't need to. I managed to get her through with the tricks that Henderson was using. But that is one of the better, more interesting stories about her. The other one is that Henderson um, sat on the plans while he was um, explaining to the um, Parliament and therefore didn't have to tell them. Steve Pang, it was formidable. I thought it was, but I just put it around. Um, right, so I think there was also an, a, a, a sort of a question about Ark Royal in terms of her armoring and her subdivision. They were all well subdivided. They were all designed to be as subdivided as they could be. However, that doesn't mean you always get the right combination of flooding and counter flooding. And you have to remember, counter flooding a carrier is very different to counter flooding any other ship in the Royal Navy because the top weight is just that much higher, so high and so much. And there's fuel and there's other things going around. So they have to be very, very careful. And don't worry, I'm not out of iron brew. I have a bottle. I am going to fill me up though. Now, why is the Royal Navy building armoured carriers? Why are they building them? Why did the exercises in 1929, which don't involve land-based air, because they're mainly in the Mediterranean, there isn't much Royal or British land-based air around there, why do they lead to armoured carriers? <laughs> well, because the Royal Navy's thinking about surviving and fighting on the other side of the world from its industrial base. The Royal Navy can't fight on the other side of the world from its industrial base and be able to fix its aircraft carriers non-stop. It just can't do that. They have to be survivable. They have to be protect, uh, able to uh, protect themselves. <laughs> Dave Burnham, I had to Google Iron Brew. Sorry, that looks awful. <laughs> it's very good for you. I make a habit of getting my American students whenever I have them addicted to the stuff. They all go home and try and order it over the internet. So much you do. Um, so. This is very much how the Royal Navy saw its armoured carriers operating. They saw them very much being part of the fighting force with the fleet. Even with Singapore or Hong Kong, Jay Richardson, yes, even with Singapore or Hong Kong, those are not really places which can do much infrastructure support. You always have to consider Singapore, and I did a global war, um, and the Royal Navy's plans for fighting global war talk again, I think it was last week. And it was designed... It's sort of Singapore is sort of the theatre port, but it's still not the infrastructure hub that's going to be able to do massive repairs and massive rebuilds. So the Royal Navy is having to think constantly about how making its ship survivable so it doesn't have to repair them so much, so they don't get entirely wiped out. Uh, Match Burn, at Dr. Clark, was there any cooperation with allowing the British carriers to use American Pacific repair yards? There was, in theory... There were certain plans, but the trouble is because of the where direction the Royal Navy was operating from in the Pacific when it got there, from Australia up, most of the American Pacific big yards are across that way. And so they're dependent more on Australian yards. And Australian yards were not really designed, again, for the sheer quantity of ships we're talking about. And that's the trouble. You can have a dockyard. You might even have a very nice facility for Australia. But is it going to be an infrastructure to support a fleet of several hundred warships? Probably not. That's what you're talking about. Eric, uh, uh, Aken, sorry, Eric Ackeren. In the Mediterranean, they needed their CVs to be armoured because they needed to protect themselves because air attacks were very likely expected to be hit. To an extent, the Royal Navy were expecting to be hit, yes. Remember, this was a time also in the 1930s that the idea was always that the bomber would always get through, that the bombers would always get through. And it's pre-radar. So how are you going to get your fighters up in time to intercept them? But the Royal Navy, again, had a slightly different policy than pretty much anyone. And it's one of the interesting things is that the Hawker Hurricane and a lot of the Hawker aircraft and the Hawker's development costs are paid for by for supplying naval aircraft because the Royal Navy keeps buying them stuff from them. Maybe for the 20s and 30s. 
And so the Royal Navy comes up with this concept again of the battle carrier. And the idea is it would keep fighters airborne. It would keep a constant fighter coverage. Now, let's just take a second there. Um, so your plan is to keep constant fighter coverage to intercept enemy, fight, enemy aircraft as they're coming in, disrupt air attacks. If anyone else thinks that sounds like the big blue blanket doctrine that the Americans are so proud of, 1944 onwards, uh, you wouldn't be surprised. You wouldn't be shocked. It's pretty much the same idea. The thing is, the American one comes from their experience in the Pacific. The British approach to it comes from their experience in exercises in the 1950s. One of the strange, joyous things about this is both sides come with their, uh, their ideas from different experiences, but it's a similar idea to the same problem. And it's only in about 1945, when both sides are getting together in the Pacific and discussing it, that they realise they've come up with the same solution to the problem, but completely independently. It's one of those amazing things in history. But you can also say it's a sort of it's a similar a similar threat, so they're dealing with it. But it's very much it is they both have their own ideas. Ah. And I would point out, yes, that the Americans a lot of their facilities were used. It, I'm not saying it, well, they weren't used. I'm just saying that using them to support a whole fleet was very difficult because of the geography for the British. Um, if you're talking about it, yes, you will send capital ships to it because it's worthwhile. But you've got cruisers, you've got destroyers, you've got all sorts of ships down that list that need to be supported to get a fleet working. Right. I've done that. I need to do slide five quickly. Slide set five going out now. <clears throat> and I do realize slide set three came out twice. Me and TweetDeck having fun again. I don't know. Me and TweetDeck. It's always fun. Now. If I sort out my papers just quickly, I can't wait till my webcam arrives. I really can't. Um, I, I sort of, I, I feel bad enough doing this with all of you who are very kindly watching. Uh, when I do it with my poor students at university who are talking to me and I, can't, I have to do it via the system, they are on actually Zoom or whatever they're te I'm teaching them history of engineering that particular time. They are all sitting there going, but we have no slides. Yes, you have them in front of them. You read it, have to read through them. Terrible. They're all having to learn. They're all engineers and they're having to learn how to read. It's me being uh, completely cruel again and again. So, what am I going to show you? So, the designs that start to come out that the Royal Navy are looking at, if we go back again, we have from 1937, Design M. And 1938, Design A. Now, I know they are both very, very faint when I look at them on the screen. Believe it or not, I can read them quite well this side. You on the screen can't, so they'll be up on Twitter shortly. And as I said also, they're all, all the slides are already up on under the title of Slide Notes, so you can find them there if you, can't, if you are looking for them and want to get ahead and I've not caught up for you. Um... And there's different pro approaches to the same problem. The Royal Navy are looking at building a fleet in the 1930s to fight a war in the 1940s. They actually do end up doing that. The Royal Navy is... Jeff Beeler, is there a good biography of Henderson? No, I haven't written one yet. Literally, there is no... I forgot Lord Chatfield, the first Sea Lord at the time, book over there. And it sits on the ba uh, bottom of my uh, bookshelf because he goes through his entire book and manages to not mention Henderson. And he was his third Sea Lord. He basically tries to take credit for everything. Um, just, just hold them still. There you go. They are designing them 
they're looking at the different forms of the fleet and how they're going to build. And what's interesting about those designs, <clears throat> especially when I put the 1938 design and HMS Implacable up, and I put them together, you start to notice a lot of similarities. That is because this becomes the Genesis design for her. And it's how the Royal Navy starts to design. They start to, they, these ships are being designed for a long time before they come into service. And they're being worked on. Because even though Henderson dies in 1939, the de Director of Naval Control, uh, uh, the Director of Naval Construction, Stanley Goodall, who he's put in place and all the designs which he's overseen being created in the 1930s because he's third sea lord, unprecedented almost, for six years. So he's in command of the design and construction and all the Royal Navy's procurement from 1933 to 1939 is the forms, not only the basis, but also many ways the designs for World War II because the Royal Navy has a choice. We can try and develop something brand new from scratch in the middle of war with all the fighting going on and all the strains on our resources, or we can go with something we know which works. They're going to go with something they know which works. Chatfield has many, many, many issues. Um, I see there's a currently a debate going on over whether or not he should have been court-martialed after Jutland. Jutland is one of those battles which... is an experience the Royal Navy learns a lot from. Mostly it comes away with an obsession for night fighting and not letting the enemy get away. It also comes away with a, with a realisation that it needs to make sure it learns from its staff and it has a staff and it has a good command structure in place and its commanders talk to each other. And this affects a lot of what's going into designs in the 1920s, 1930s and World War II. Um, Jeff Beeler, losing Courageous and Glorious really blew away Henderson's strategy. Not really. And the reason I say it didn't blow away his strategy was he was planning on scrapping them anyway. Courageous and Glorious were supposed to be gone in the 1940s. The whole thing was that they would be replaced, they would have been replaced not by Ark Royal, but by Indomitable and Indefatigable. Uh, the Implacable and Indefatigable, and probably Indomitable, um, would replace them. They would have been getting far bigger, newer carriers coming in. So they would have been gone. Um, remember, Henderson is designing his strategy. And the theory going around in the Royal Navy, or rather the hope, was actually that Henderson in 1939 would go and command the Mediterranean fleet for about three or, four, three or so years, come back and be the Sea Lord, probably by the time any war started, because Henderson was considered so good at the strategy side of things, but also at the managing politician side of things. And that was a real skill the Navy needed, a realised they needed to have for any major war. The ability to manage the politicians so the Navy could get on the job of fighting the war. Now. If we go back to. And. I'm always worried I'm going to lose it, but. I don't think I have. I haven't. I put it to one side so I could grab it easily. Because I'm smart sometimes. Too smart for me and good. So, if we consider all that's being designed into these ships, all that's being des designed into aircraft carriers, the RAF station for 6280 single small twin range aircraft, the anti-aircraft guns, the power station, it starts to make sense that the Royal Navy was having to do a long-term designing thing. And the idea that the Royal Navy suddenly in World War II goes, oh, you know what, carriers are useful, let's build some, suddenly starts to look very, very silly. That's what I have my biggest argument with some of my colleagues about. Because it fits very nicely if you want to sell a certain perspective of naval aviation. And that perspective usually is that everything comes from the other side of the Atlantic. And the Americans are very good at naval aviation, but they're very good at their type of naval aviation, which is different from the Royal Navy's. And this is the other thing I want you to consider. 
The Royal Navy didn't forget H. Massagus, and they didn't forget what they were going to be looking for. Now, H. Massagus was, of course, one of the first carriers ever built. And she becomes really critical as the template for the escort carrier. The Royal Navy actually start running exercises in the early 1930s, where they start working out how to do support convoys a long way from land, a long way from air cover. Because again, aircraft range wasn't that great. One of the things that you find recurring in Royal Navy reports about cooperating with land-based aircraft is that often they're finding those aircraft have very short radius of operations. So they're always looking at the idea of how we're going to cover the aircraft gaps of convoys. And they're approaching convoys from a very cynical perspective. Because they're thinking at convoys maybe across the Atlantic in a war against Germany or Italy. They're looking at convoys through the Mediterranean, again, in a war against Italy. Or they're looking at convoys across to Singapore. And maybe even convoys as far as Hong Kong or Wei Hai Wei, which is far more likely, likely as the forward operating base against Japan. Wei Hai Wei is a far better facility. Admittedly, uh, it's a technically Chinese territory. But for some reason, uh, the British government and the Royal Navy didn't understand, um, anticipate the Chinese in the 1930s being very anti them using a major port to fight a war against the Japanese. I can't think why. So. To get the stuff to Wei Highway, it was going to need to be escorted. HMS Unicorn might be used for the role, but HMS Unicorn was rather big for the role. And frankly, she was rather useful moving aircraft. So, Argus, the escort carriers. And the more of them they build, the more... They're taking on Argus's role because Argus in exercises would sometimes be used as the strike ship, sometimes be used as the fighter ship, sometimes be used as the escort ship, sometimes be used as the anti-submarine warfare ship. Argus wasn't built as the prototype for the escort carrier. She becomes it because the Royal Navy is using her exercises and thinking, hang on, what can we use them for? So, engaging strategy. Do the max feature in the Iron's pre-war planning for escort carriers, or were they a bit of a rush wartime manager? Again, you find ideas being discussed at, in various meetings of the uh, Institution of Naval Architects, where the directors, uh, the naval constructors, and the civilian architects, naval architects, get together and talk about things like aircraft carriers and what they can be used for and various other things. And actually, Henderson seems to receive these notes, lots of notes being received. So there's lots of discussions being considered about it. So Mac ships, I, uh, Mac ships were sort of, they weren't a completely new creation. For wartime, they certainly were ideas thinking about them, but actual proper plans, probably not drawn up. But certainly there'd been some loose talk and enough discussion that when they did create them, uh, they weren't that difficult. They were all, it was all there. It just needed to be pulled together. And of course, though, this is HMS Unicorn acting as flagship for several escort carriers for operations in the Mediterranean. And that was often quite the case. Now, here's the thing. That wasn't an unexpected scenario. And the reason I say it was unexpected was because Henderson had considered it a likely idea that in any scenario where the Royal Navy needed multiple escort carriers and they got used for other things, they would need a flagship. And the obvious flagship would probably be the ship which was one level up from the escort carriers, rather like with destroyers and having a light cruiser for the rear ramble destroyers. So, Unicorn is a forward aviation support ship with surprisingly large communications and command and control facilities and the ability to stock staff. Now, Juno191, can you make a video that lists the books you'd recommend for sources? I can do better than make a video. Try Ray Sturviant. This one. And this one. So... These are some great books. Golden Eagle, at Dr. Alexander Clark, do you live in the US? No, I live in the UK. I am actually a sorry lad. 
So I'm just south of London and currently in lockdown. Major lockdown because both my mother and sister, in fact, my mum's got the full letter from the government. Um, my sister is also quite high up on the list of um, people with very severe asthma, so have got to really, really avoid coronavirus. Sheppy42, unicorn leading CVs makes all kind of sense. It does, and she's actually very good at it. Jeff Beeler, Way Highway was never fortified by the RN. No, it wasn't. Uh, for two reasons. One, because he does, it, it, the, technically they don't own it enough to fortify it. Two, that would make it too obvious for the Japanese. And three, their plans on fortifying was that they would have to probably recapture it from the Japanese. So why build any fortifications? They then have to fight themselves. For those wondering what I'm drinking, it is the Iron Brew. It is special. <laughs> Juno 191. So going back to your last video, Unicorn was like a tribal. Um, yes, Unicorn was in a effect a bit like a tribal destroyer in that the Royal Navy had built a ship which was technically under one heading but actually could fit into lots of other headings. So the tribals were technically destroyer leaders, but could fit in the destroyer role quite well, could fit in the light cruiser role quite well, could fit in a lot of things quite well. And the same with HMS Unicorn. She was technically a forward aviation support ship, but she could fit in as a light carrier quite well, and she could fit in as an escort carrier, she could fit in as a maintenance ship, and she was an excellent maintenance ship. She would keep the Royal Navy's fleet going. Very, very well. And one of the interesting things I have in front of me, if I can remember the notes, and I have the notes sitting in front of me, so I should be able to remember them. That is, which one was this? I do remember which one this was, no, I should do. It should be printed. That is amazing. I have managed to lose my notes of which carriers one is. Ah, no, I don't. Im I've just spelt it back wrong. It's HMS Implacable with two destroyers in escort. And this was actually something else which the Royal Navy start working out early on in World War Two, uh, in early on in 1920s and 1930s, that the aircraft carriers are going to need destroyers. First of all, they're actually put in as a plane guard, so that if the plane goes down, they pick it up. Then they're put in as security in case of a destroyer attack at night on cruisers. And slowly it becomes quite a big thing that destroyers are critical to carry operations. The two need to work together well. And they do start making sure they do work together. Uh, Ian Greenley, I think it's like a Scottish version of Fanta made from all sorts of weird stuff. No, Iron Brew is not like a Scottish version of Fanta. Uh, it's more uh, it, it's more an orange sparkly version of Coke in terms of probably its health quality. Fanta is quite healthy compared to Iron Brew, but I like uh, Tom Coke. Can we have a separate video on the history of Iron Brew? <laughs> Maybe eventually. Ian Greenley, Implacable looks like majestic to me in a photo. Well, there's no surprise in that. If we get. HMS Ocean Up, HMS Implacable. You'll notice that the Royal Navy are building all from a same genesis of design. The Royal Navy came up with this. It's rather like modern Volvo cars, okay? If anyone sees them, they all look like a sort of scaled version of each other. They're all made from the same design template, scaled and sort of remodeled to fit that particular role. Well, it's the same with the Royal Navy's approach to aircraft carriers. They come with a base design. And the base design is... Well, the best example of the earliest base design I can find is the 1936 Design X. But there's also a 1934 one as well, which is even earlier, which is sort of a genesis even before this. So 1934, 1936, the Royal Navy really works on its designs. And it comes up with this as the core design. And from that point on, 
all aircraft carriers which are built, which the Royal Navy builds, especially their HMS Unicorn, the light fleet carriers, the, uh, the strike carrier, the battle carriers, every single, the armor carriers, all the stuff they build are drawn from this design house, this sort of design idea. The idea is the flight decks, the strength deck, where they're going to put the weapons on, where they're going to put the shops, where they're going to put the engines, where they're going to put all the stuff which puts it together. That is how they think it about they are basically have come with a good core design and they spend a lot of time working on that core design. There are whole papers in the Institution of Naval Architecture, papers which are these sort of in these books. I've got, thank courtesy of my dad, I have the entire collection of these. He was a naval architect and he was very, very good. And he is upset, you know, I managed to read for all these and there are huge numbers of papers putting in them. And then I go into National Archives and I can find a start and point to the archive material which points to those papers. So they are all looking at the, the Royal Navy's been developing a concept of naval aviation and a concept of aircraft carriers. The concept of naval aviation works around their aircraft types. They're looking at their type of thing of what they need the aircraft to do. They want to do a long range strike. Specifically, they want to do long range strike at night. They also want to be able to keep up a constant flow of air operations. The reason the Royal Navy prefer a constant flow of air operations is because in their exercises, they think the big strike's great, but when you have the big strike going in, you leave your carriers open. So you risk a Coral Sea midway scenario where your big strike's gone in. Well, hey, you're going to hit the enemy. Well, hey, as long as they find them. Ugh. But you also might end up with a scenario where the enemy managed to hit you while that's taking place. So the Royal Navy's idea is if you keep your fighters airborne, if you keep the fighters in a rolling up and you keep strikes flying and keep strikes going, you can actually keep up these hits, keep, go keep the hits going and you won't get that scenario. You won't ever be we uh, be sort of weakened. In car, why was the skewer not retained longer as a dive bomb? Um, the answer to that is something called uh, the Dauntless and then the Hell Diver. Basically, the Royal Navy gets something better. The Royal Navy had been sort of limited by its access to engines and its access to engineering. They had built a good dive bomber but they didn't have really the best one available. So they went and got, bought the American one, which is better. <laughs> Tom Cope, drinking game idea. Every time someone says something nice about Henderson, you have to down a glass of iron brew. I would get through iron brew far too quickly. Uh, okay. Mm hmm. Juno 191, Combat Air Patrol, is that what you're talking about? Uh, yes, but I don't like to call it a Combat Air Patrol. The reason is the Combat Air Patrol, especially in modern pilots, has radar guidance and is forward from the fleet and is all sorts of things go into it. And it brings up a far more organised idea than what they had then. In the 1920s and 1930s, when they're first developing this, basically the fighters are sitting above the aircraft carrier almost. They're sort of doing a figure of eight above the aircraft carrier. And it's why when I'm looking at... when If you look through some of these... Uh, the ones on fighters, you'll notice sometimes I don't list range, I list endurance. Now, the reason I do that is because actually the Royal Navy didn't specify range. They were specifying endurance. And the reason they were specifying endurance was because they wanted to keep them up there to provide air cover for so, uh, so many hours. So if they had endurance in one case... The Blackburn skewer was given a range of 760 miles and endurance of four and a half hours. Uh, Golden Eagle, at Dr. Anders Clark, are you engineering PhD or historian PhD? I'm historian PhD, but I teach engineering students history of engineering. So. Oh, there's lots of questions coming, so I'm just going to try and answer some of them. Uh, Brock Plane. So the RM prefers small strike groups going in on regular interviews rather than the USN method of large strikes. Yes. Um, what Would the small strike method not result in higher losses against enemy CV group? 
again, the Royal Navy was looking at what the Americans and the Japanese were sort of planning. And especially if they were fighting at night, they thought the small air groups would A, have more chance of getting there, and it's far easier to coordinate a small group at night than it is a large group at night. But leaving that to one side, they were also thinking that whilst the Americans or the Japanese were launching their large strike, and remember, if they're doing carrier versus carrier warfare, it's only against those two navies really likely to take place. The French burn is not really something the Royal Navy is sweating. In fact, their exact ideas were if they ended up a war against the French, the burn would be the thing they'd sink last. Um, the American strike sort of the idea, their idea was basically the Americans' a strike would come in and they'd be, get, their Royal Navy's fighters would do their best against them in the air and then the they would, the Americans would be keep having a strike or the Japanese in the same thing. The Royal Navy fighters would do their best they could if they caught them in the air and they would help them. But remember, in the 1930s, when they're looking at it pre-radar, those fighters are going to be alerted by pickets of destroyers and frigates go uh, pickets of destroyers and cruisers sorry frigates don't come again to world war ii do apologize force of havoc for an uh, from an earlier podcast i was recording for something else um the fr uh, destroyers and the cruisers would be acting as a picket and going there are aircraft inbound from this direction and then the fighters would get the call and go wee down to them so the losses would hopefully not have been higher basically brock Dave Burnham, I love your emphasis on ship design. Naval architecture principles govern warships as well as cruise ships. They do. And also you have to remember with naval aviation, you've got a development of both the aircraft and the aircraft carriers. You can't have the latest aircraft come on board if your aircraft carrier doesn't have the lift capacity to take them, doesn't have the uh, doesn't have the launching facilities from them. Remember, doesn't it or doesn't have the recovery facilities. Remember, in the 1920s and 30s, the Royal Navy's at the front of developing all these things, but they st that means at some points their carriers have um, systems which are designed, their arrestor cables are not designed to slow aircraft down when they're landing, but to stop them falling off the side. So instead of being strapped across the deck that way, they're across the deck this way. That's to stop the aircraft, because their landing so is so light, blowing into the sea on the off the side of the ship. It's only after a while that you start getting aircraft heavy enough that's not going to happen. But you still have the swordfish coming to service, which is so light and buoyant that when it lands, you can actually reach out and grab it. And also, again, I'll say this. I did say this in the previous uh, video on unicorns and a flock of swordfish. But the reason the Royal Navy ends up with two-seater for all these things is because... Even with beacons and other systems the Royal Navy developing, to go long range, you need someone in the back to do reconnaissance. Also, seeing as the Observer Corps, the people who were the in the second seat, were all from the Royal Navy, they were actually the part of the fleet and the Royal Navy had the most, un uh, most control over in terms of personnel. And they were also the ones who had the most influence coming back to the Navy. So getting as many of them experienced in aviation as possible was critical for the Navy to develop its naval aviation. It needed them for the strategy. They could only get the strategy if they were getting the flying time. So the more aircraft you have which would take them and to take advantage of them is better. <laughs> Mitchell Oates, I will not uh, uh, retire to your Samarana. That comment about engineers have to learn how to read. I mean to that. Yes, I'm currently in the middle of marking 400 uh, first year engineering students history of engineering paper where I have to, uh, where I have to con compare two engineers from history and say what lessons experience they learned for, uh, they can learn from them. And it's it, it's crushing my soul slowly. Honestly, they're, they're good. They're making good attempts, but my God, they... <laughs> Uh, Dr. Alexander Clark from Golden Eagle. Wouldn't it be better to use battleships to strike rather than strike carriers? No. Uh, what the Royal Navy's plan was that the strike carrier would hang back from the fleet. Hopefully the enemy wouldn't find them. And then the Admiral could at the perfect time go, 
strike and a mass strike. So the Royal Navy still wanted to deliver that big punch like the Americans and the Japanese, but they wanted to have the battle carriers with the fleet to fight the battle and stop, break up the strike, the, the Americans and the Japanese if they were fighting them, and then clobber them. And remember, mainly they're looking at the Japanese, but they also keep an eye on the Americans because they can't afford not to. OK, it's not because they don't like them, the Americans, or the Americans don't like the British. And I've said this before, but both have a realistic policy in that they are the two biggest naval powers. They're each each other's biggest potential threat if something really goes wrong in the world. And so they have to keep an idea on each other. They can't afford to go turn around to their government and go, uh, we've ended up in the worst case scenario against uh, the Americans. We have no plans for that because we thought they were always our friends. And the apologists would go around, but you're supposed to secure the country. You're supposed to be paranoid. So they always have, they always think about it. Uh, Juno191, do you agree with Drac that the BF-109 and JU-87 was a terrible idea for carriers and people said they were a good idea and need to be shot? Uh, no. Well, not entirely. Uh, you see, I have a friend called Dr. Marcus Faulkner, who's obsessed, who does a massive amount of research on the German Navy. And he would tell you that they had a lot of good ideas for how they were going to use them. I don't think that they would have worked out that well. I think the BF-109 might have been OK. They seem to do OK in Norway, the variants, the naval variants. The JU-87, I'm not quite so sure about with carrier operations. Um, but I think it was an idea. And I think it would have been interesting if the Graf Zeppelin had got to see. I would have, the Royal Navy would have enjoyed that fight. It would have certainly given them something to talk about. And engaging strategy. Given the RAF's focus on twin-engine bomber and attack aircraft, was there any thought of putting one on a carrier, or were they treaty limited CVs too small to consider it? Again, with that one, the Royal Navy could have built the carriers to take it. They could have built the carriers to take a twin-engine aircraft. But again, remember what I said about how the engineering advice goes backwards and forwards. So they have all the advice. It has to go through so many layers of government and different people that they never quite get it. So the twin engine idea never really comes back. The Royal Navy would have liked twin engine aircraft, but their focus on single engine aircraft and the, the, the idea that that was the only thing that carriers could take were what drove the 2000 horsepower engines and a lot of the really cool single engines which come through. So you consider it after World War II, the Royal Navy does get into twin engine aircraft. They do modify the lifts. They do what they need to do to get like, the twin engine aircraft. They're useful, but then jet engines come in. Uh, Colin's dad, the farthest gunshot I believe ever was in World War I when the General Wolf hits targets 36,000 yards away with 18 inch guns. Possibly, but I had heard stories about Warspite and Scharnhorst. <laughs> right, at Dr. Anderson Clark, a chaps and break, at Dr. Anderson Clark, not true. Hell, they built the world's largest tank factory in Detroit with six foot thick walls because they thought we might bomb it. True. That's pretty much it. The, the Americans and the British, they trust each other, they're good friends, but they still understand that they need to build just in case. They always have to, you have to protect your country. Right, I'm going right down to the end. Let's see the questions. Um, Steve White, Americans had some side lefts and could have helped the UK to get quickly get an elevator for larger planes. Just sticking a lift is on the aircraft carrier is not an option. Actually, it's quite a major thing to stick in and lifts on the side of a ship and how you balance them and how you try, try and put all together. 4A1, how would the Royal Navy search for, find and strike the aircraft tonight before the use of radar? Well... That's one of the interesting things. The swordfish was their main tool for doing that. Uh, their plan was hoping that there was some kind of moon in the night, but that wasn't really essential. Their plan was to try and find the enemy in the late afternoon and then shatter them. And then at night, guide in the strike based on their radar aircraft. It's rather similar to what the tribal class destroyers did to the Bismarck in that... They were put on her in daylight, and then all through the night she had four destroyers sitting around her going, Hello, fleet. Come here. This is where you'll find the Bismarck. It was That was the Royal Navy's policy. Mohammed Sun, Doctor, you should make a video about your books collection sometimes. All that books on the shelf behind it looks interesting. It's not just those ones. 
The ones on the shelf are just my quick access ones. Then there's those. Then there's those. 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 And I won't tell you what's in there. There's a lot of books. Basically, I have a small library. I don't have a bedroom. I have a small library. And this is my office workspace. There just happens to be sleeping space there. <laughs> Colin Stad. Yes, sir. That's the shit the shit record, sir. Just say, saying the father's gone shot unless Drac is full of shite. Drac is never full of shite. Drac is very, very good. I have a lot of great uh, great respect for Drac, and I enjoy his stuff tremendously. Um, he's been very kind and very helpful to me because... Not only have I done this and I've done an interview with him, he's very much helped me out in that I have a, currently a bet going with my aunt for familial bragging rights over to whether I will get to a thousand people or not subscribing on the YouTube. And he he seems to have taken this personally as have some others that I will make it to the thousand so I can get to do my happy dance. Ian Greenley, wasn't the British carrier issue the height of the hangers rather than lifts? That was also an issue, but again, you can design. What happens is the Royal Navy works out very quickly. Um, if you want aircraft, which we'll do, and um, let me just position this properly. So, uh, you can, to get aircraft to fit in your carriers, you have to do, they have fold up their wings. But if that is too high, what you do is that, and that makes it lower. And you can also swing them back like that. And you can do all sorts of things to try and make the wings lower to make the aircraft fit in the hangar. So hangar height is often used, the, uh, used as an argument against them doing something. But honestly, the Royal Navy can usually work out a way around it when it wants to. Uh, what, uh, Lightning Shadow, what are some good sources of British cheap plant in the Far East? You've mentioned a lot about possible plans for way, high way and such. My Google skills are failing me. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Right, right in behind me. The best book at the moment, and Andrew won't mind me saying this, is The Royal Navy Strategy in the Far East by Andrew Field. It is a very, very cool book. It's very interesting to read. But honestly, when I'm going in the archives and I'm reading the material, I am working out where they're basing these things on. Because if anyone's looked at the work I've done on Tsingtao and the events in the China, what the China squadron were getting up to and what the Royal Navy's town class cruisers were being used for out there. Uh, they are, you know, Wei Hai Wei is this major base, but it's not mentioned by name in any of the war plans. But they mention a lot of code names for bases. Even in the war plans, they're given code names. So I'm presuming from the description of one of them, I can't from the top of my head remember it, that that is Wei Hai Wei because the description of it fits only with Wei Hai Wei and that's the closest British base to where the Japanese would be. Sorry to lean so close but I have to go to this. It's where I keep all the pieces of paper of my past presentations. And so cruisers, no I don't want the cruiser one. I want the, da, 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 uh, where is it? Mm, Destroyers, cruisers. Doo, doo, doo. I didn't realize I'd done so much. Ah, there it is. Ew. Way highway. No. Wei Hai Wei is here, and of course Japan is here. Trouble is Singapore is down here. So that's a full finger away. But Hong Kong is that far away. Wei Hai Wei is that far away from Japan. So basically the only place that the British could operate succinctly in range of Japan is from Wei Hai Wei. It's the only safe place. And the range of the swordfish. If it's written down on these sheets, but it is 770 miles with internal fuel only, no external carrier. Now, the thing about the swordfish, and please do remember this, if they want to extend the range, they have an internal extra fuel tank they can add in. It goes in the observer's seat, and the observer sits in the gunner's seat at the back, so it goes in the middle of the seats. 
right? The way the Swordfish cockpit is designed, it's in sort of two buckets. The pilot sits in one bucket and the observer and the gunner sit in the second bucket. Now, for the attack on Toronto, they all had to have this extra fuel fitted. And what that meant was that these things leaked, okay? And they leaked and they found a level. So all the observers manning machine guns, firing tracer themselves, going into the Italian attack on the Italian harbour with tracer coming up, were all waist deep in aviation fuel. I said this on the, uh, the, uni the Unicorn and Swordfish one, but they are really, really brave guys because they are going into a, fire, into a firefight, firing tracers, sitting on top of a 1,800-pound torpedo, which is mostly full of high explosive, and they are waist-deep in aviation fuel. They are incredibly brave. They deserve a, I don't know, a monument needs to be built to every single one of them. Let's go all the way down. Oh, good Lord. Uh, Connor said, at Dr. Alex, how well did the Royal Navy do with kamikaze attacks while supporting the Okinawa landings? And did the Royal Navy actually use Mark 737 fire directors sent by the ESN? Um, the Mark 37 fire directors were all to be fitted to ships, but they're mostly being fitted to the battle class and other uh, battle class destroyers, HMS Vanguard, all these things, which actually didn't enter service till the war was pretty much over. <laughs> so they had them. They were being sent to them, but they didn't arrive really in time. A few did get into service, but not many. Um, and the kamikaze attacks they dealt with really well. Armoured Carriers keeps putting out these brilliant videos which show the kamikazes hitting the ships. And there is always the joke that they then pipe sweepers, manual brooms, but literally they are dealing with the damage very well. These ships have four and a half inches to three and a half inches of armor over large chunks of their deck. They have one and a half inches of armor around their, the um, lifts, these sort of things. They are well designed for taking impacts, especially if the aircraft, unless the aircraft comes in per, at the correct, perfect angle, it actually bounces upon impact because of the armor. They can do that because the flight deck is the strength deck. Once you make the flight deck the strength deck, you can protect a lot of things. Now, Please don't think that the Americans were being callous when they didn't do, it, uh, do, do this. But the American idea was that if you make the hangar deck the strength deck, you can better protect the rest of the ship. So if there's damage in the already very high explosive part that is the hangar, i.e. explodes in peacetime, you're not going to lose your whole ship. It's There is an idea. You know, you have the wooden top, explosion goes out, ship still survives. It, it doesn't work quite that way in practice, but it's the idea. The Royal Navy's idea is that you put armor beneath the hangar, you put armor over the top of the hangar, and you, so you have protection for both. And then you put in lots of fire curtains, you put in lots of fuel safety systems. In actual fact, the fuel safety system the Royal Navy use in World War II is a development of a system they found on the German seaplane carrier they captured at the end of the World War I. They thought it was rather good and was slightly better than the British one, so they used it. It becomes the basis of their system, which they put into Courageous and Glorious, and then it gets evolved, and by the time World War II, you've got a very good fuel management and safety system being put in British aircraft carriers, which is why fires often don't, don't spread around in their, fuel, in their fuel system, because they've got this system in place. Uh, Black Velvet MD, what's your opinion on the Deutschland class cruiser Bodok Badabarship? Mainly it's main guns that they only have two turrets and that they are quite large. Sorry about the spelling. Um, I've done a whole series of videos on the Graf Bay and the River Plate 80, as I call them. And my opinion of that particular heavy cruiser is that it's a very lovely idea for the Germans to go. Not, pra not really sensible for anyone else. Not even that sensible for them. It's an idea. They're basically replacing ships which are which are pre dreadnoughts, and they're trying to develop them. Going right down to the bottom. Colin Stad. Ooh, so that's why our in hangers were so small compared to US flat, uh, flat, to uh, flat tops. Thank you for your answer again. Oh, it's a pleasure. That's what I'm here for. Um, Steam White, airplanes are the best defense. Lots of planes is active defense. Waiting and hoping your deck stops the damage. Optimistic. 
Yes, but that was the Royal Navy's idea was that you would have the fighters airborne so they'd hopefully stop the attack or at least disrupt it and then you'd have armour in case of them if they got through because the idea was they would have quite a lot of them. Chaffers of Bray, not an Ark Royal. Single fire hose plumbing and no redundancy, I seem to remember. Actually, there was redundancy built into the Ark Royal system, but... <laughs> it's not really as well used as it should be. Um, the Ark Royal is a case study in a lot of things going wrong. And the Ark Royal has problems in that the Royal Navy is surging up its carrier forces quite a lot at this time. And so it suffers from having a lot of officers aboard and a lot of carriers who aren't used to aircraft carriers because the Royal Navy, even though it's had a large carrier force, is suddenly growing that carrier force many times over. It's dealing with also growing its fleet air arm many times over. This all means that you have the experienced officers less and less. Now, in a small ship like a destroyer with a small crew of a couple of hundred, you can actually manage that quite well because you the officers tend to be the junior ones coming in and the junior rates and you tend to, tend to keep the experienced ones when you're building an entire aircraft carriers and you're crewing aircraft carriers you've got lots of officers coming at different levels and you need to be very very good to get and make sure they're all working at the same speed and with the arc roll they have a lot of trouble with damage control it causes an entire Actually, not a rewriting of the book on how the Royal Navy conduct damage control. It caused a rewriting on how they train people to use the book on damage control. In that, instead of them being given the book and presumed they'll learn it, they are basically sat down in a room with the instructor going, you will learn this or you will not get out of here. If Renown and Prince of Wales hadn't had deteriorated pom-pom uh, ammo due to tropical heat and humidity, it might have survived in 741. Traces would have made a big difference. Uh, mm. Mm. Possibly. Possibly. I uh, Myself, I'd have preferred to have an aircraft carrier with them. I'd have preferred to have an aircraft carrier. It would have made things a lot safer out there. Uh, the, the Royal Navy's plan always for the Far East, and I got into this in the global war discussion, was always to have an aircraft carrying cruisers out there. The reason you have those combinations is because cruisers are useful for economic warfare. Their basis of deterrence against the Japanese was that they would destroy their trade if they went to war with them, which is why the town the county class are sent out there and why the town class are sent out there. Those ships are sent out there because they are commerce raiders. They're the Royal Navy's version of a surface raider and they can be used as such. So an aircraft carrier would be out there to support them. When you're sending out battleships and you can only send out two, you're basically showing how weak you are. That wasn't what the Royal Navy wanted to do. It was only pushed forward mainly by Churchill and others who saw battleships as these huge, magnificent beasts of British prestige and honour that they could deploy out and that they would deploy and they would look powerful. But actually, when you're facing off against a fleet that's got a dozen of its own battleships and you can only afford to send two, you look weak. If you don't send any, you're basically saying, we're so confident you, you won't risk fighting us. We don't feel we need to send the battleships. If you send enough battleships to outweigh them, then you have to strip all your battleships out of the Mediterranean fleet, out of the, uh, out of the home fleet, and you, you can't do that. So actually, you'd have been better off not sending them and better off managing to get an aircraft carrier ready and some cruisers and sending them. But actually, cruisers were in even more demand than battleships at the time because cruisers were essential for so many operations and same with carriers. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Bit of a left field, engaging strategy, bit of a left field question. But do you see much design continuity between the various Second World War carriers which last into the mid-80s in the Iron Service and what came after with CVs and QECs? Okay, have a look at HMS Unicorn and have a look at HMS Invincible. And you'll notice that there's a very distinct similarness in the bow and the design. I do see a lot of similarities between what's used. And I think with the Queen Elizabeth class, again, if you look at some of the way they've structured the layout, you've got some very much some of those ideas which the Royal Navy had pioneered in the 1930s coming through. They are good ideas for how to lay out your aircraft carrier because the Royal Navy spends a lot of time working them. Remember, also, the Royal Navy has a lot of experience of what not to do, how not to lay them out because Courageous, Glorious and Furious are all conversions. So is Eagle. 
Hermes is the only purpose-built carrier they have. And so they see what the problems are and they see what the issues are. So when they start building their own arc from scratch properly, they really do push into making sure they build uh, capable ones. Okay. Bandholm, perhaps you should do a talk about Corbett and how his views define the RN strategic fort. It helps a lot to understand why the RN built a lot of what it did and how it fought. Um, yes, but actually, I think in the 1930s, the Royal Navy's moved a bit on from Corbett. I think the Royal Navy has started to think that Corbett is useful and is a great basis for what they're thinking about. But they're also thinking about how they're going to fight the wars because Corbett is very good at the strategic stuff. Mahan is very good at the battle stuff. But what the Royal Navy is thinking about is largely the stuff which will come out with James Cable post Second World War. War. In fact, Cable is how it really develops. When you're talking about naval diplomacy, deterrence, conflict management, these are what the Royal Navy is thinking about. And so I would say, actually, I will go through them. At some point, I might well do a talk where I go through... Mahan, Corbett, Richmond and Cable and I talk about all these ones because Richmond of course is the guy who's alive at the time he's a former Royal Navy Admiral and he's nuts he is absolutely nuts um, but no he is the guy who's the famous naval theorist in the late 1930s and he causes all sorts of issues Juno 191, I think Icy was converted into that half battleship, half carrier. Correct me if I'm wrong, Alex. Yes. Was she good on paper, not so good in reality? <laughs> well, talking about good on paper, not so good on reality. The Royal Navy has its own ideas for the battle carrier. <laughs> yes. The Royal Navy has its own plans for a battle carrier, for putting battleship guns on an aircraft carrier. God help us all. Um, no, it's, it's a lovely idea on paper, but it's not really one for reality. It's like the Royal Navy's battle carrier concept. Um, it's lovely on paper, and in the rules of the treaties, it makes sense while you're enforcing the treaties to do it. But in practice, you really want them... Be you want to combine the battle carrier and the strike carrier. You want one type of carrier, and you want to pull them back because you don't want your aircraft carriers getting close enough to be in gun range of the enemy battle fleet. You really don't want that. Although, <coughs> Royal Navy carriers have a habit of doing so. Uh, Mitchell Oates, documentary from some years back. German raider captured merchant with British defence plans aboard, gave them to Japan. Japan realised how weak the British were in the Far East. In the nicest way, Mitchell, I love that um, a particular... I think I've seen that documentary. I love it. It's complete and utter twaddle. The Japanese didn't need to get, get any information to realise how weak the British were in the Far East. The Japanese made it their business to know what the Royal Navy strength was in the Far East from about 1915 onwards, and they were very, very good at making sure they knew it. They didn't know where the Royal Navy ships were. They didn't know always what the Royal Navy plans were. And if you consider the Asmamaru incident, uh, where the HMS Liverpool snatches a Japanese liner from off the coast of Japan to get German merchant seamen off, they could the Royal Navy could really deliver some surprises. But the Japanese knew exactly how weak the British were long before that. It's one of those things where people love to try and put the connections together, but it's kind of a bit, in nicest way, it's a bit racist, and I. We shouldn't probably put it in the nicest way before that. It's comforting to try and believe that the only way the Japanese could beat the British or could understand how weak the British were was if they were helped by the Germans. They didn't need it. The Japanese were very good sailors and they knew what they were doing. They made some horrendous errors, but the intelligence they were gathering wasn't that bad. When I hear that laugh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is, that my laugh is pretty scary. My my students run when they hear me laughing now. Um, engaging strategy. The 80s Iowa Stovall battle carrier idea makes me want to gouge up my eyes with a rusty chance. Engaging strategy, you need to learn to calm down, be less stressed by them. These work. And actually, there are lots of people coming up with the 8-inch guns put on crew aircraft carriers. That makes sense. When you're not sure where your aircraft carrier is going to be, 
in the in the fleet where it's where you're not sure where it's going to fight and it might end up with cruisers and these things are you going to defend a put assign a cruiser to a carrier or can you give it eight inch guns so it'll defend itself sounds good the courageous and glorious also carried guns and all these sort of things the Royal Navy very quickly, especially after the 1929 exercises, gets around to the idea they're going to need cruisers, they're going to need destroyers, they're going to need what we would in turn call a modern task force as part of the carrier, because you need to build this battle group. And especially once the Royal Navy starts thinking about how it's going to use its aircraft carriers to deal with surface raiders, i.e. the cruiser carrier, the task group and the battle group becomes a very critical idea. They start working on it in the mid-1930s, and they come with lots of very interesting ideas, which are still to, to this day. Um, layered defences. You know, different ships having different types of guns so they can provide air defense or surface defense at different ranges to make, keep the enemy away. All these things are part of that. And... I saw an interesting question back there. And... Have I managed to burn? Have you ever been to America and seen uh, any of the carry museums here? I'm lucky. I'm not too far from Mount Pleasant. I've seen US Yorktown. No, I'm incredibly jealous of you. I'm also more mo massively jealous of the fact that anyone in up there can drive up to Canada and see the last remaining tribal class destroyer, which is HMCS Haida. I find that absolutely cruel because I love those ships and I am writing a book pretty much inspired by them because they are so useful and the British have kept not a single one of them. Not a single tribal is still around in the side Atlantic. It's over in Canada and I haven't managed to get over this. Juno 199. Uh, would Taiho be a copy of the of British carriers? Yes, pretty much. By the end of World War II, both the Americans and Japanese, for all their protestations about how the British were wrong and how the British didn't know about naval aviation, are copying completely Royal Navy plans for how to build aircraft carriers. Um, and also the Americans are copying a lot of the British strategy because the Americans, especially once they start doing the big blue blanket, are suddenly looking at the British and going, hang on, you maintain constant air operations? Yes, we do. How do you do that? Because we have our ideas. How do you do that? And they go to the British. The British sort of go, well, well, this is how we do it. And the Americans go, well, this is our experience with the British ideas. Put them together. Come up with the American methodology. The American methodology is very good for the Americans. For the British who have a different approach to aircraft maintenance and management, it isn't. It doesn't work. So they have to go a different way. At Dusby 102, at Dr. Alexon Clark, how much influence did Bernard Ackworth actually have? I've heard suggestions he was friendly with Chamberlain. Uh, you can have a lot of ideas and influence. You can be friendly with a lot of politicians. But there are a lot of people who get a lot of publication because of their own writing and the write-ups they were given in press at the time. It's like when I'm talking about history when i go with the example of louis the oh, no not even louis let's go with uh, francis the first francis the third of france was very it was a renaissance king he is uh, owns massive estates and all these things he is massively rich on paper that impresses historians it's the same with aqua he is on paper he is massively important he's got an influence on all these things henry the seventh who was the king and at the time and of course henry VIII's father was very rich in terms of money he kept a lot of money. He was known. He was considered miserly, but he kept a lot of money in his at his disposal. He had a lot of gold, a lot of stuff ready there to uh, for a treasury in case he needed to fight wars and these things. That impressed contemporaries. I would always say Ackworth has a lot less influence than Henderson, but Henderson is a lot less known about because he's the third sea lord, and instead of writing things or making speeches. He builds ships and he's the one who builds ships. And this is the interesting thing about the role of Third Sea Lord. So the Admiralty signs off on a ship, but they sign off on the design, the big structures. There are then thousands of little changes which are made. There are all the discussions of how to make the case for in Parliament. All the discussions with members of Parliament, all these things, the inter little discussions are done by Henderson. All the meetings of the shipyards, all the decisions are made by him. So... He gets his fleet built by what he presents to the Admiralty Board to make decisions, by also what changes he makes in designs after being ordered. 
Black Velvet MD. What would have happened if the Germans sent Bismarck class, Sharnos class, Admiral Hipper class, Graf Zeppelin, and all its remaining destroyers as a fleet out to sea? Uh, they would have had a bump into the Royal Navy Task Force, which was sitting in the um, sitting in Scarpa Flow, literally for that. The Royal Navy kept at the beginning of if that had happened at the beginning of World War Two, they would have found two flotillas of tribal class destroyers. Uh, a full squadron of town class cruisers, uh, about four or five capital ships and two aircraft carriers coming out after them. It wouldn't have been pretty. Plus about four other flotillas of other destroyers. But even after Narvik, they would have found pretty significant forces waiting for them. Planet 767, yeah, I'm surprised you guys haven't saved any of our your old carriers. Did you at least save a battleship? We didn't save anything. The largest thing we saved is HMS Belfast, which is a town-class cruiser. She's a lovely ship. I have a lot of respect for her. But honestly, I'd prefer it if HMS Edinburgh hadn't gone to the bottom of a load of gold and then she'd been one saved, because I think she had the better history. But, you know, that's life. <sighs> Seriously, the, the Labour government post-World War II... We're going for the new heater technology. So we're going to sell and scrap everything. Bastards. To use the French. Uh, Ian Greenley, War Spray even tried to preserve herself at Prussia Cove. Yes, she did. There is actually, if you go to Cornwall, you can actually find a huge slab of her armour sitting not far from Prussia Cove. It is colossal. It's brilliant. I've got a picture somewhere of me standing next to it. And you see how thick it was. Massive. And of course we do preserve HMS Victory. Warrior is also... Um, HMS Warrior is also another one we preserve along with HMS, uh, Mary Rose. They're all next to each other with Victory. Warrior is the most underappreciated preserved ship in the world, I swear. Go and look round her because so many of her... She is such a disappointing transition between... The Age of Sail and Victory's World, and the modern ships. Right. Ah. What check, Bazillo? You don't have to pronounce my name. I know it's not easy. I probably just mucked it up. I hope I didn't insult you. Have you ever seen the eldest destroyer existing, which is R.P. Bleska? Um. Built 1937 of Polish Navy, now museum ship in Gimme. Uh, no, I haven't seen her, but she's also... Uh, yeah, she is the oldest destroyer existing. There is a light cruiser existing sitting in... Um, uh, over in Belfast, which is slightly older, but yeah, she's cool. Uh, I haven't seen her, but I've got lots of pictures of her because she tended to end up fighting with um, tribal class destroyers. Uh, sh uh, you know, she did a lot of good work in World War II. <laughs> uh, Bandholm. So they would have met a number of tribals and ships that could view the tribals tearing the Germans apart. Well, the town class cruisers were also fairly good at tearing Germans apart when they got a chance. So um, it would have been a contest between the tribals and the town class over who, no uh, who notched up the most kills, probably. <laughs> oh. The Black Jackal I would say Belfast deserved to be preserved She did some good work during war and survived having a keel blown I agree Belfast deserved to be preserved Never think I don't think that HRS Belfast deserves to be preserved I do It's just if Edinburgh had survived the war And I had to pick between the two of them I'd have probably picked Edinburgh Her big sister Because of some of the things she did But Belfast does deserve to be preserved And honestly we should have had about three town class. If we were going on deserving to be preserved, Belfast, Edinburgh, Liverpool all deserve to be preserved um, from what they did in the war. But of course, Edinburgh had already sunk during the war. Uh, tribal class destroyers. Well, HMS Nubian got almost, has almost as many battle war credits to her name and battle credits to her name as HMS Warsprite. Think about that. A little destroyer is only one or two. One, I think it's one actually battle credit behind in terms of service. HMS Warsprite, and yet she wasn't preserved. Juno one nine on Belfast also helped to sing the Sun Horse. She did. 
She was backed up by some Canadian tribals as well while doing it. <laughs> uh, I think the uh, I think the video is lagging behind the audio. I'm hoping not too much. I'm hoping it's sort of keeping up. Uh, Jay Richardson, no HMS Nor uh, Norfolk. I like Norfolk. Um, I think she was a... Let me check now. You asked a question and now my brain has gone blank. I'm sure there was an HMS Norfolk. Uh... Yes, she's a county class. Uh... <laughs> yes. So, um, with the aircraft carriers, the Royal Navy and its developments are pretty much the Royal Navy and Naval Aviation are try trying to develop itself in the 1930s. And they've just started to really build the stuff, getting back to them, which turns into the Royal Navy Aviation, but World War II starts. And that's the thing. If World War II had started in 1949, uh, no, 1942 for Britain, rather than 1939, you would have had a far different fleet almost facing the, uh, the actions than you did in 1939. In 1939, it was on the cusp of transition. In the, by 1942, it would have been well into transition. And by 1945, it would have been transitioned to the new naval aviation, the new, uh, new system they were doing. Because they were planning about 8 to 12 aircraft carriers being built, all sorts of things they had plans for. And the naval aviation was being developed. So whilst we talk about the aircraft that they had in service, remember the moment the Royal Navy got control of the fleet air arm, the first thing it does before even actually it officially has the fleet air arm in 1939 is the third sea lord, go, uh, uh, who's in 1939 at the beginning of it, Admiral Henderson, orders the new next generation of engines, the 2,000 horsepower engines. So they've already realised that the engines they've got aren't powerful enough for single-engine aircraft to be proper fighter, uh, proper fighters, proper torpedo bombers, proper aircraft for what the Royal Navy needs them. So they need more power. And remember, prior to swept wing and supersonic, the big thing that made your aircraft go, power, uh, go fast was a big, powerful engine. So that's what they were focusing on. So the Royal Navy had the aircraft it had in 1938 and 1939, but you've got to consider that in transition, because if you consider the average service life during the interwar years was four to five years of an aircraft type. They go through seven types of spotter reconnaissance aircraft between in 20 years. So it's three to four years of service. So the Royal Navy, the aircraft they're buying in 1938-39, they're thinking that in 1942, they'll be completely different new aircraft. All right, then. I've got some questions come up which I'm going to quickly go and answer. Uh, the... Colin's dad one. At Dr. Alex, why didn't the RN have ships for museums purposes, especially the war spite? Are there any surviving British World War II carriers around? Nope. There are none. Um, I don't think any of the light fleet carriers are still around anymore. Uh, I don't think anything's still around. I think they've all gone now. I don't think... Um, is, has Virat been saved by the Indians? I don't think it has. So there's not even Hermes, which is the nearest legacy. It's just not. It just wasn't saved. Um, they didn't have the money is the reason given. They were reconstructing after World War II and they didn't have the money. It's always the reason given. And also, besides, who cared? Uh, Ian Greenberg, did you see the Sony images of Royal Oak released for the last month? You can clearly see all the four torpedo holes, but otherwise she's surprising on numbers. Yes, you can see them and it's really cool. And that actually gave me an idea for looking at uh, the Bismarck and seeing if we could get to see the torpedo damage done to her by the tribal class destroyers to see if we could see if there had been damage. But the trouble is, she, uh, Bismarck, because she skidded down the side of a volcano um, in the ocean, is, while she's perfectly upright and is actually very well preserved, her waterline level and all below is actually in deep in mud. So you can't see. It's annoying. Right then, so, um, 
I'm down, managed to get down to the bottom of all the messages, and I, it's been an hour and 50 minutes, so I do conscious that other people probably want to have things they want to do. But before we go, any questions before I, before I finish? Uh, Kiram96, what do you think of digging up the graph shear? Uh, I prefer not to touch war graves or any of these ships. Um, Jane Peter, are there any decent plans to preserve the most recent HMS Ark Royal? She's already gone. She's already gone to the breaker's yard. Uh, I think she got broken up in Turkey. The Black Jackal. We'll cross fingers then. If, it, if you're saying Hermes is still on the cards of preservation, we'll cross fingers, and I hope she is. Um, Max Burn. Would be interesting if you were, if you could get a small ROV into the Bismarck to investigate a ship. It would be very interesting. That is another option. It's getting the funding for it. It's getting people interested in the idea of it. Um, Scarpa is granite, hence Royal Rogue is in the mud. My friends are still all rig divers, but have been to the bottom of Scarpa to say it's rather clear down there. It is. It's very, very clear. I've got a friend who's got a little diving sub thing and he's actually using it to investigate um the polish submarines and seeing if he can track down some of the polish submarines which were sunk in world war ii and try and find out their stories and prove what they had done and um he's do he's doing a lot of work now uh jeff beeler do you have any written materials right you'll find a whole series of articles on a site called global maritime history which there should be a link to on the top of my page on youtube uh there's also stuff in my patron which is coming out. I have a book, which I've got a link to there, which is coming out in December, which is on tribal battle and daring class destroyers. And is looking at how the Royal Navy's destroyer, uh, destroyer sort of develops uh, during World War II, how they start off with their fleet destroyers and how they become by the end of World War II. Uh, Hermes, was sold, uh, Hermes, Hermes was sold for scrap back in July 2019. I thought she had been. It's, it's terrible, really. Uh, Mitchell Oates, USN's 1930s designs for flight deck cruisers. The, they, there are lots of the ideas for using aircraft involved in cruisers and how to do them, but the Royal Navy pretty much goes to the idea of aircraft launching from aircraft carriers and cruisers doing what cruisers do, and they find that working together makes the best sense for definitely for surface warfare. And I saw another question go... Uh... And right, so I hope you've all had a good time. I will do always answer the questions as best I can on Naval History. I will uh, uh, on my Twitter at AC underscore Naval History and in the comment section and below. I also tend to respond quite quickly. Please do, as I said earlier, subscribe if you've liked this because, as I said, I'm in a competition with my, uh, well, my aunt has basically betted me I, I wouldn't, so it's for familial bragging rights. I need to get to the 1,000. And uh, share, tweet, anything you can, because, as I said, familial bragging rights are at stake. They're important. Um, I am going to be drinking some more Iron Brew now because I think I've made a make a voice to a cry. Wish some would mad expedition to Chesapeake. Lots of battleships. Yes, there are lots there. And please come back and enjoy. I'm doing another one on Tuesday at six, uh, British Standard uh, Summer Time, um, which is going to be looking at sloops, the very small ships which get forgotten by everyone, but are very cool, including the Halicon class. And I think I've got another one on Thursday because usually what I do, Sundays are specials. Um, Tuesdays and Thursdays are the regular days when I do these talks and sort of answer questions and I'm doing them like this. My plan is longer term, one will go to a record, pre-recorded video and one will continue, uh, probably Thursdays will continue as the regular talks and Sundays occasionally. But um, whilst definitely I'm on lockdown for COVID-19, I'm going to keep them as long as I can to me, uh, two sessions of me talking and asking answering questions and so Tuesday is Tuesday is April uh, sloops during the interwar what were they for 
and looking at that. And first of all, it is a question of getting there. Landing craft on amphibious warfare from commander race to continental invasion. Basically, I are sloops an age of sail thing uh, from glowworms? No, they're not. Sloops are the smallest ships which are considered warships, which the Royal Navy can build, and they're completely unlimited by treaty. So the Royal Navy can do what they like with them in the interwar period, and they really do use them. And they make a lot of them and they get into all sorts of things. Uh, they were used as ASW escorts. They were used as gunboats. They're used by all sorts of things. And on Thursday, it's about landing craft. So I'm going to look at the history of landing craft, where they come from, and talk about all of them and how they develop. Uh, no modern sloops. Well, uh, it's uh, Iskander Tab. Uh, if you look at the river class ocean patrol vessel and many of the modern OPVs, I would say they are pretty much sloops. The question is, sloops could be very heavily armed for fighting operations, or they could be lightly armed for sort of policing missions. They were all sloops. We didn't have the idea of an OPV in this. We all had, They were all called sloops, and they worked very well. Knight Heron production, what if one Navy, let's say Iron, had developed and incorporated angle flight decks at the start of war? How much a difference advantage would that have had? Not a lot. Fly angle flight decks are developed because of... Um, because, developed be literally because of jet aircraft and because they're landing speeds. When you've got str uh, propeller-powered aircraft, when you've got non-proper aircraft, they can land and take off at the same time with just a barrier in between them, and they'll be fine. It's safe to operate both ends. You develop the flight, uh, the angle flight deck when you've got aircraft coming in so fast, you can't, if they stop, they're going to go barreling into the aircraft in front. And they are twice a week, Colin said. So it's Tuesdays and Thursdays. And I, it's a pleasure to do them. I'm enjoying them. As I said, I'll only change to doing back to doing pre-recorded videos when I'm no longer at home. Because basically what I'm doing is I'm using the time I used to use for commuting to do these videos. Because I don't need to do the commuting amount. I'm working in this space. So... Um, does be one or two. How useful would ASV two have been made? Been in Night Strike by the Sawfish. It would have been very, very useful if the RN had had a chance to get to radar prior to 1938-39. Radar would have been a major feature of the Royal Navy because once they get it, they get all over it. They really love radar. Um, they were already obsessed with beacons and beacon technology for night, fly uh, night flying and for helping aircraft get back from long ranges. So getting radar, which could actively find other ships at night, oh, they'd have loved that. Um, Juno 191, uh, would the ramped design aircraft carriers be effective in World War II? Not really. Uh, it, it, we don't really have aircraft which can t use a ramp facility in World War II. So it's basically, it's the catapult ones. Or if you've got swordfish, you don't even need a catapult to launch them. Honestly, they are so good at generating lift. And that's why the swordfish design is built as it is, by the way. People look at the biplane and they go, oh, it's old fashioned, it's terrible. The Royal Navy were lagging behind. They weren't. The Royal Navy wanted a long range, ultra reliable night torpedo bomber that was easy to fly and can carry a very heavy load. In the 1930s, the answer to that was biplane. And remember, the original version of the Wildcat was actually a biplane fighter. So biplanes were not that silly in, 19, in the late 1930s. It, the monoplane comes on as, a, as the critical thing as World War II happens. But in the late 1930s, going for a biplane was not a stupid idea. Stephen White, have to get into sloops in on the Great Lakes. Very much that type of warfare. One frigate only. HMS Conference. Sloops mostly and, and one gun gullies. Yeah, sloops have a long tradition in the Royal Navy and they evolve from a great age of sail tradition into a great fighting steel tradition in the interwar period. Uh, Night Hero and Production. Forgive me if you answered this already, but since you were talking carriers in. Good lord, that disappeared quickly. Uh, since you were talking carriers in time, uh, what are thoughts on Highball and the Sea Mosquito? Uh, they are... Oof, it works. Uh, highball is a nice idea, but I wouldn't like to actually try and use it in combat. And the Sea Mosquito, well, if the Royal Navy had managed to get that into service in time, would have been very, very useful in a war against Japan.
<laughs> Bad home. Sawfish was a helicopter that had been told to be a plane. Yes, in many ways it was. Um, Askana, do you know of any good accounts of contact between Luftwaffe fighters and FA Hellcats or Wildcats? Yes, I do. Eric Winkle Brown has a book which I cannot see around me. Let me see. Uh, turning on the lights. Uh, no, I can't see it at the moment. I might have loaned it to a student. But Eric Winkle Brown's life story book, it's a little tiny one, is great for Hellcat fighters because he's, he's, he starts off as a Hellcat pilot. That's what he starts off. That's what he's flying Wildcats and then he flies Hellcats against all sorts of things. And then he gets into testing aircraft. So look up Eric Winkle Brown. Ian Carr, how are beacons not a risk of the enemy finding carrier? They were a massive risk for the enemy finding carrier. But in the end, the assessment was made that if they were kept on a limited enough frequency and low enough power, they were more critical. It was better to try and preserve your aircraft safety, and it was a justifiable risk. But really, the Royal Navy are leaking so many emissions, it's terrible. Hmm. <laughs> Uh, Juno one one one. Uh, so Yamamoto as a show was literally one hit wonder. Um, yeah, don't use an eighteen inch gun for AA. Uh, if you're a county class cruiser, you can use your eight inch guns for AA because the county classes, um, the first generation of them, their guns could go up to seventy degrees, so you would have eight inch shells coming at you. That was not a ship you wanted to fight if you were an aircraft. Right. Uh, it's now been two hours, so I am... Does be 102. Is the beacon that big giant than the master of the armoured carriers? I think you answered your own question there. Um, it was part of the time, yes. Sometimes, uh, eventually they evolve into radar and the beacons get moved. Uh, turning, uh, tuning 343 at Creative Hall, the Citizens this Air Raid, Jeremy Clarkson did a great info doc on it. He did. That is actually a very good one to look at. If you do have time, look up Jeremy Clarkson's Citizens this Air Raid, because that is an amazing story, and he has a really big personal connection with it, and so he really does a massive effort on it. He also did one on PQ-18, the Arctic Convoy, which went all to pot. And that also is a massively good story. Anyway, take care. I'm going to finish this now because I'm almost running out of iron brew. And frankly, my policy is once I run out of iron brew, I don't talk. Start to, I don't keep talking sense. So take care. I hope you all enjoyed this, and thank you for joining me. And I hope to see you on Tuesday. Ron Shield, uh, new to your channel. Very interesting conversation. Thank you. Thank Drac for the recommendation. I had a chance 20 years ago to tour HMS Ida, almost complete access from the engine room forward. She's amazing. I, I want to go out to see her. I keep seeing video tours of her by my friends because I have three Canadian naval historians who are friends with me, who are doing PhDs with me, including the great Don, uh, Dr. Samuel McLean. Please go and look at his work on some of the stuff of the Navy of the, of the early restoration period and that stuff. It's amazing stuff. But the guy sends me videos regularly of HMCS Hyder, so I swear he's trying to torture me. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you can join on Tuesday for the next one. Thank you. Thank you.